Episode number three, Devin Hannibal Nicholson. Devin is an accomplished amateur wrestler turned successful professional wrestler. He is also known as Blood Hunter in wrestling circles. In his journey, he's climbed multiple mountains of difficulty, as you'll find in our talk. When he's not dropping bombs in the wrestling ring, he's managing his company Great North Wrestling. I've been to three of those shows, and they don't disappoint. He also runs the highly sought-out YouTube channel, The Hannibal TV, where he talks to a wide range of interesting people. Devin has had a documentary made on him called This is Hannibal that won three awards at the 2012 LA Movie Awards, as well as a global TV documentary in 2011 called Blood Feud that aired nationwide three times. He is part of the upcoming fourth season of Vice's Dark Side of the Ring TV series in the Abdullah the Butcher episode that also airs on Crave TV in Canada. I met Devin years ago as a young and hungry heavyweight wrestler in high school. We were sparring partners. It was a pleasure to train with him. I have watched his life from afar, and it's one that has lots of ups and downs. Ultimately, the triumph of the human spirit burns well in him. Here's my conversation with Devin Hannibal Nicholson. Devin, it's finally good to catch you, man. You're, you're a hard man to pin down. Yes, well, it was. Uh, I've been very busy over the past few weeks, but things are starting to calm now a little bit until yeah. the next uh, event. Yeah. Uh, yeah. How did it go? I, I didn't get to I could get out to it, but you, you fought twice, right? Is that correct? Yeah. The, yeah. Yeah. No, it went well. Um, it was our first first one in a few years, so um, we were happy with with how it went. Yeah. yeah. Good. Good. Yeah. Listen, man. Won both I'm, my matches, so yeah. you can't complain about that. Good. I'm impressed that you're still able to get in there and take that damage and deal it out, right? Like, how do, how do you find your body these days? Are you still holding up, or? Well, I've had, what, six or seven stem cell injections. Those have helped. Yeah. Um, so I, w- I wish I could get more, but I can't get more right at this moment, but hopefully next year. Yeah. I'll get more, but those have those have done wonders for me and doing yoga. Yeah. I I try I, I should do it more, but it does help. But obviously uh I'm not two hundred and eighty five pounds anymore and I never will be that big again. Yeah. I just hover around two hundred and sixty. Um and I'm not wrestling that much. So yeah. Where, more, did more your, where did you get your stem cell work? I have a friend that's done that in Panama, you got it done. He said it's it's like a miracle therapy, right? Like the first time it was in Phoenix from Dan Severin's guy uh, from the UFC. He actually had horrible knees uh, from all, and he was also an amateur wrestler. Uh, Dan Severin, highly successful amateur wrestler in uh, NCAA, and I believe he was Olympic alternate. Uh, in the eighties for heavyweights. He fought he wrestled out of Arizona, ASU. He actually gave me the tour of ASU. But um his doctor there uh gave me one in my shoulder and then one in I had torn my knee amateur wrestling before. And uh it was coming up on ten years post the surgery and when I was running it was bothering me and I wasn't and I wasn't able to do squats. So it it not only it's it I, I was supposed to get shoulder surgery prior to COVID. So I went to the US during COVID because I got sick of the COVID rules. Yeah. Um and that avoided my shoulder surgery, but then I ended up getting follow up shots after. But it, it compl- my knee wasn't terrible and my knees haven't given me any problem since. But then uh I met a guy in New Jersey from Prodigy Stem Cells who's actually a wrestling fan of mine and gave me a much better deal nice. on stem cell shots. So I've been back there three times. I've got three more in my shoulder, which they were saying it is surgery. And up to this point, I still haven't had to get the surgery. And then I tore my chest in October, 2021 in a wrestling match. It was completely torn. And with our, how slow our medical system is here, the first thing I did is the next week I drove to New Jersey and got one shot in it. And then I got two follow-up shots. 
and now without surgery, uh, my torn chest healed itself. Because by the time they called me in, in uh, Canada for the surgery, it, it had already healed through the stem cells. So, uh, so I do recommend uh, recommend them. But I, I I understand they are cheaper in places like Colombia and Panama. If I if I had twenty or thirty thousand dollars, I'd go and get everything done. Yeah. So how does that work, right? So my understanding is, like, I don't even know all the details, right? Did they explain to you what it does to the body and how it helps? Or well, there's a few ways of of doing it. The one way is uh, is they actually use your own stem cells, which is more expensive, and then the other is the baby umbilical cords, yeah, which is which just gets thrown out otherwise, from my understanding. Yeah. And these these are stem cells that you have yourself and I'm no medical expert yeah. to to repair tissues, but they're adding extra in you. Yeah. So so they'll inject they the the other thing is the New Jersey one they use an ultrasound thing and they find out exactly where the issue is. Yeah. And then they uh they inject it right in you. They also do exosomes. Which are similar, similar to stem cells. I have a few videos on my channel of people search Hannibal stem cells. Yeah. Uh, where part of the deal was for the New Jersey ones that I filmed them giving me the injections, but they told in those videos exactly what they do. But honestly, I felt immediately, immediate relief. And I actually heard that Dana White had a neck issue and he was against stem cells and Shale Sonin somehow got him to go to his stem cell person and when dana white got them in his neck it immediately fixed his neck issue yeah so so it does work yeah ray mysterio the wrestler yeah is in his 50s still wrestling in wwe and i i actually saw him recently do an interview where uh, he actually had an addiction to pain kill pills and stuff and and was contemplating retirement and then he went to one of these places in Panama or somewhere and got everything done. Yeah, my um, friend my friend had it done in Panama and he was saying I think he either heard this story or met someone maybe in the waiting room or something, but it was like a seven year old dude that was basically getting the work done and now he's climbing mountains and so it seems like this is like really regenerative, right? Like it really is gonna make yeah. the body heal itself it sounds like right and, and give us a chance to to live right so yeah and there's another there's another type that i haven't had yet where they'll actually put an iv in you and you yeah. can get this done over two or three days multiple times and this stem cell iv will just go through your blood and it will like find everything wrong with you yeah so yeah it, it's a it's a miracle uh, thing it's still not approved in canada because uh it's illegal for some reason in Canada. We're behind on the times there, but hopefully it will be eventually. Yeah. yeah it, so certainly as an alternative to surgery, right? Which surgery can, can do its magic, but it can also make things go south real fast. Like, like might not work, you know, right? I blew my knee out. And uh, it also uh, takes time, right? It takes sur- time to wait for surgeries. It takes yeah. hospital time. But yeah, yeah, you blew your knee. Yeah. Yeah, I blew it out and I got it repaired. I've blown a couple blown a couple knees but the dark i like running right i think you and i have not cross paths running over the years but you've seen me or i've seen you running but like yeah. the doctor's like look i can buy you like 15 more years of running I'll, I'll trim your meniscus and it'll get you this much and i i was like okay let's do it right and i've had knock on wood there are no problems but so it was i had a uh, flat tear i think it was and i was just lifting too heavy and not just doing crossfit right and i was i did my heaviest clean sets ever like and it's just too much, right? So, but my knees are, are so so. You know, I, I'm still running, still training, right? I mean, that's part of what we want, right? Incorporate all this stuff to keep going longer, right? And doing things, right? And, yeah. I think cleans are bad for us as we get older because I recently <laughs> tore like something in the insertion of my bicep off of yeah. cleans. Yeah. Are you doing heavy though? Or like what? What are you throwing on? Uh, it was. Yeah, well, I stopped doing it that now, but yeah, yeah I, th- I think it was cleans that aggravated it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's a very um, intense exercise. I, I still do them, but I don't put, I put like max 135 pounds on the bar, and I don't do anything heavier. I'm still doing clean and press, oh, so overhead, and I don't put more than 90 pounds. Right? 
I think I'm at the stage two, right? Where I don't feel like I have to load the weight up, right? I'm doing it more for mobility and just to live healthier, longer, right? But, but when you're young, right? It's like stack on the plates, right? And it's, it's with that yeah. mindset, right? So I don't go heavy really on anything but deadlifts and, and shrubs because yeah. those two exercises don't seem to bother me. Yeah. Very controlled uh, too, right? Yeah. I mean, deadlift, I think, is... And actually, uh, go ahead. yeah, go ahead. deadlift, you can do, like, one one rep at a time. Yeah. And it still will have a benefit. Isn't it overall probably the best comprehensive movement, right? A deadlift, like, you get all your legs, you get your back, like, it's, your core is tight. You know, I think it's probably the most comprehensive. Yeah, and actually, I did. I, I figured out this, this workout that uh, someone recommended to me. Uh, that you just do deadlifts, so it make it makes them a lot less tedious than yeah. if you're have to have to do legs after. Or if you're doing them at the end of legs, you just warm up and then you do like five to ten sets of one rep, really heavy, and like that can take you an hour, but it, it works really okay. well, and you can go heavy. And as you said, if you're strict and you know what you're doing, yeah. and you're only doing one rep heavy at a time, it's not really that that risky. Um, listen, and I want to go back in time if you're up for it, but I remember when we first met, like, I remember seeing it's you. It's your, your podcast. All right, let's do it. You want. Let's go back in time. So you were, I don't know how old you were when you, when I first saw you step into the room. It was at Brookfield High School, right? And you were this. I think this, it was at Woodruff the first time. Was it at Woodruff? Time. Okay. Then it was at, then it went to, went to Bro uh, Brookfield the following year. Yeah, we changed venues, but you stepped in and I remember you being this big kid, right? I'm like, okay, this is great, you know? And, I remember wrestling with you in those years and I always had to go a hundred percent, you know, which was really great, right? Because of your skill and your size, right? It was a really a nice, I found it when I transitioned from competition to being a coach, right? It was always nice to have kids come in that you had to, I had to actually wrestle a hundred percent with you, right? Which was great, right? Um, but I, I'm curious, I like, I'm asking all the wrestlers that I talked to this question because I think you won a Canadian title, but in your last year of high school, or when did you win your first national championship in last time? Was it? Yeah, my, la my last yeah. year of high school. Yeah. But so where I started training with you is grade, grade, uh, or my first year of high school, I think I made it to the equivalent of the states or the provincials. Yeah. And then the, the, everyone from Ottawa does that, that team practice before they go to the provincials so i hadn't yeah. even heard of this this wrestling club okay uh throughout the entire time i lived in ottawa and i i would have done it since i was a kid had i known but yeah. when i discovered it then and, and i realized in that practice it was so much better than the high school wrestling practices yeah. that the following year i i figured i was going to go there and i definitely never i definitely will credit you uh for for making for making me uh, successful in high school because I was wrestling you at all those practices yeah. as well as some other college people, yeah. so it put my wrestling and, and you were you were beating me, yeah. so you can, you can't get better, yeah, by by wrestling other high school students and, and destroying them all the time. But it, you yeah. were fresh out of the university, I think, yeah. yeah. Um, so it's like and you were about. You may have been even a bit bigger than you are now, but uh, so it, it it put me to that next level training with you. Yeah, I mean, I remember that, right? I had to go, and I, I, I wanted you to earn a score, right? I wanted you to earn some points, right? So it was good, and you know, I still had a bit of gusto in me to be able to do that, right? I probably couldn't do that now, but um, but let's let's think about that, that year you won that national title, right? So what was going through your mind in the semis, right? So you just come off the mat. You've won this the semifinal. You're in the finals of the national championship. What were you thinking? Like, what kind of mindset did you have, or what kind of things were you fat fighting inside Honest, yourself? Honestly, what what the one that meant more to me was what, when I got the Olympic uh, qualification silver years later. Yeah, because honestly, um, off when I won the uh, provincials in high school, it meant that was the one that. Um, you know, as a kid in Ontario, it's such a big deal to win. Yeah. And and to me, I wasn't even, I was just doing those weekend tournaments 
with the club, and I didn't even really think that it think of it as a national championship, which may have been a good thing in okay. the end. I I did I didn't remember um, thinking about the significance of it until like five years after that, and ten years after that. Back when I went back into amateur wrestling, ten years later, I'd be like, Hold, and I was like, man, that was really hard what I did. Yeah. But at the time, because you just get into that grind of wrestling every single weekend and going to the to the practices and you're in high school, I didn't even think of it really of anything significant at the time, yeah. to be honest with you. Yeah. But Sounds I do, good. looking back at it now, it's I'm, I'm so happy that I got that. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it sounds like you're just focused on the process, right? And not necessarily thinking about the outcome, right? But we're grinding, right? Practicing, training, competing. Yeah. And then you, you returned. I right? did. And I yeah. did follow that up by one. I did win the, I defended that. That was in London that year. And then I defended it at the, uh, the BBC national team trials. And I beat that, that same guy again, two in a row. Yeah. Um, at those trials, but, but at that time, I don't know if it's any different now. There was no funding, and it was to go to Uzbekistan. So, at that point in time, yeah, I think uh, that's. And a... again, now, now knowing how important that was, the other thing I'll tell you is, well, my parents were supportive. Obviously, they they paid to get me in those tournaments and stuff. I don't think they had any idea what I was doing, how it was special at that time. Because if I could go back in time, I would have stayed in amateur wrestling. Because I, looking back on it now, um, like, I don't think in high school I got one point scored on me in my senior year. Yeah. Like, I was I was really good, but all I was thinking about around that time was I want to be a pro wrestler. And in reality, if I had just taken the amateur wrestling thing further, they would have recruited me out of amateur wrestling and I would have had a way easier job. But, yeah. but my parents, they didn't even like, and I, they're great parents, but because they weren't athletic or sports parents, they didn't realize that maybe they should have pushed me a little bit harder to, to, to keep going down the amateur wrestling route. Yeah. So, so looking back, yeah, I mean, that's one of the things I think I learned from knowing you, right? Is like, I always wanted you to sort of, go on with your amateur career but i also understood you had a passion and a dream right so there's that too you know like sort of looking at the professional side of things right and wanting that right which i mean i've been following you you've had quite the um roller coaster of a ride in your professional career right yeah and i did as i said like ten, like i in 2001 that was my last amateur wrestling match was the olympic or not the olympic the national team qualification trials um and i ended up turning down scholarships i had one to university of buffalo which i really again i if i could go back and slap myself i would and then one yeah. uh to, to to simon fraser there yeah. but then like i got the bug again 10 years later after i had done some grappling and when i was doing these grappling tournaments um, cause I was thinking about getting into MMA. Um, but everyone was telling me your amateur wrestling is great. Cause I was winning the grappling just with the amateur wrestling, right? Yeah. I wasn't any great grappler. I was just good at the double leg. And basically I knew a couple of grappling moves well. So yeah. it motivated me to do some amateur tournaments. And then I did do amateur tournaments for a year. Um, and even with the with the torn meniscus, I did tear my meniscus, and I ended up still getting second at the at the London Olympic trials. But but it made me think, man, if I had only continued, because I was yeah. out of it all these years, and then you know what it's like. I was traveling to uh, to Montreal a couple times a week to yeah. to train, and I was uh, at Vin Lavoie who also went to Simon Fraser, who you know well, he was personal training me, wrestling me yeah. to prepare me, but it was just made me think. That's when it really hit me, like, man, I'm too old for this now and I don't have the yeah. money to keep to keep pursuing this. Yeah. But I, I 
it made me regret it that much more, but I didn't regret doing that year because during that year, I ended up beating at the Toronto Open. I beat the guy that won the CIAUs that year. And I was like 28. I mean, you. And I didn't even have a coach. I was just grabbing random coaches at those tournaments. I yeah. remember uh, Marty from Brock did it yeah. once. Uh, yeah. They were they were just like, it was whoever was around. So. Sub in, right? To have someone in your corner. Yeah. I mean,. Yeah. I think it got around me out of a it got me out of a depression though because as you said throughout the uh the reason I didn't fight MMA which I'm sure you'll get into afterwards because I I had con- contracted uh hepatitis C from a wrestling match which which was from being assaulted with an infected blade and I was in like a massive massive depression because I wasn't going to be able to do pro wrestling or or MMA but in amateur wrestling there, there's a rule that they they stop matches if accidental blood occurs, and they they actually gave me permission. So it like it gave me uh, a boost yeah. and and something to live for. So it would actually so actually doing that actually kicked me out of a a downward spiral where I may have ended up killing myself. I didn't know you were in that dark of a place. I knew it was painful, right? But I didn't know it was that dark for you, right? But You've told that story well, a lot, because right? it's uh, the, the the first treatment failed. Okay, I had gone through the first treatment, and it didn't work. And they told me at that time, when I was like twenty eight, twenty nine, the prime of my career, and I had just lost the WWE contract. Right? Yeah, I was supposed to basically go and be rich and live in Florida, and ended up I was working at a group home here which was a good job. They found out I had hep C. They released me from my group home job uh, because uh, I was dealing with violent individuals. Um, so basically, I lost my job. I was living in my friend's basement, and my doctors were telling me it would be eight years before a new drug came out that they think would actually cure me, mm. which ended up, a new drug did come out, but I didn't have to wait eight years because I ended up going to the States to get cured. But um, I I had no job. Uh, my wrestling dream was shattered. Yeah. <laughs> and, like, I was living in my friend's basement. So, like, well, I, 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 may have, I may have not actually tried to physically kill myself, but I was I, I definitely did some things during that time. That I, I have to believe that there is, that, that there is something looking over you that I should have died from, but for whatever reason, um, I, I survived, but I ended up getting out of that dark area eventually, but it was a few years of, of, uh, of severe depression. As, as you guys can see in some of those videos where I'm like crying every time I have to recall that I, I, like I, I could, and I also got mental health help. I saw, I seek, I saw professional help, which, yeah. which does make a difference. I didn't yeah. just not do anything about it. Thanks for sharing that, right? I think it's, it's important for people to recognize that getting out there and talking to somebody if you're struggling, right? On a professional level is, is a good thing, right? So, and you, you got out of it too. It sounds like by doing, like leaning into something, right? That could give you a sense of purpose and meaning, right? carry you out of it right so but yeah that's um what yeah what got me out of it is uh i'll tell you what got me out of it i was a personal trainer at the time for the city of ottawa too yeah which i still work for the city of ottawa but i was personal training a guy's wife and i had conf- at, th- at this time i was ashamed of having hep c because it it's one of the stigma um diseases so i didn't tell anybody and I had this, uh, this woman that I was personal training regularly. Um, oh, and by the way, I had started the legal situation by this time, yeah. but it wasn't going anywhere. Um, I didn't have very good lawyers and it was just draining my money. And, and this, this woman's husband had his doctors. He had gone to med school and he had also gone to law school and he talked to me and he said, Hey, your your life is terrible now. I could see it. 
and I can see how depressed you are. Why don't you go public about your situation? Because at least if you go public about it, maybe it will, it'll get somebody to come out of the woodwork and help you. Yeah. And that's exactly what happened. Number one, a, a lawyer heard about my situation and that lawyer was the one that ultimately won me my case and got the guy's blood work and all that. But also, um, superstar Billy Graham, a former WWE champion that also had hep C and had also wrestled the same guy in his career, hooked me up with his doctor and it was his doctor in Phoenix that ultimately got me on the cure that killed me. So if it wasn't for this guy advising me to go public about it, which, which is a big deal to go public that you have hep C, yeah. especially at that time. Um, that, that also helped me get, get out of my, uh, out of my zone. But by, keep in mind, by that time, I had already got my silver at, at the Olympic trial. So that was also important because it was like, I had already showed that it's not that transmittable because I was legally allowed. I, I was honest with it, um, with, with the commissions uh, of the amateur wrestling and they allowed it to me. So that was part of my, my coming out, acknowledging that, that they said I was okay to wrestle. Sounds like there's some validation there, right? And, and you got support, right? By be, being open about it, right? And bringing it up to the surface, right? Versus you can imagine holding it down, right? And pushing that stuff down inside you and keeping it there. I and mean, that, that's where it festers and all that. Yeah. And it, and it's, it's funny that, and when I came out about it, that guy never wrestled again. So it at least, at least stopped him from, yeah. continuing to to do that because he was still he was still bleeding despite knowing that he that he had it but it wasn't just bleeding and for me it was actually cutting me which is worse because it puts the cutting instrument it's like sharing a needle when you share a razor yeah. razor blade um but everyone always says and and i know a lot i know several wrestlers that never went public about having it and the reason people don't go public about it is because it's not good for your career to go public about it. Yeah. Like people aren't going to want to hire you and aren't going to want to work with you. Yeah. And in day to day life, strangely enough, it, it, it affected me in a positive way going public about it. But, uh, a lot of people don't want to go. So that's the reason why a lot of people don't. The discrimination involved with it, right? And the, and I lost my real job too. I mean, that was a good job. I, I'm only high school educated. I had done like courses to get those group home jobs and I was, I was making good money working in a group home. So, uh, I mean, going public about it, like that job didn't require blood tests and, and it wasn't, uh, uh, a, a qualification of the job to have to disclose your blood test. But when they, when I went public about it, it was, it was in McLean's magazine, Global TV did a story on it, CBC did a story, CTV, it was in the Atlantic in the US, so it, it went public, the Ottawa Sun. Mm. I mean, so that's how my job found out. And that's when they said, Hey, we're sorry, Devin. Um, by the way, they, they did hold their word. They said, if I ever got cured, I'd get the job back. Yeah. They did give it to me back years later, yeah. but that was just another loss from from the disease, yeah. losing losing a job where I was getting like over forty thousand a year from that job on top of my city of Ottawa pay, and then I completely lost that job. I had to go back to doing security, which, yeah. which sucks. You're getting attacked for a, for a bit of a wage as a, as a bouncer. How did how did the cure work? So what's like scientifically or just even just generally what did what was the cure like? How did it work? Well, yeah, but, but as I said, now in 2023, there's a much much easier cure. Just to tell you guys, and that's when that's when I mentioned when that doctor told me, and I think it was 2010 to wait eight years. I mean, I, that sounded terrible to me because it's like. I'm in the prime of my career eight years from now. Like in the end, I am still in good shape eight years later, but I, that, that just wasn't an option to me to wait eight years. 
So I the 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 normal treatment was interferon and ribavirin for 20, 24 weeks. Um and that was the one that failed for me and had very very bad side effects. People can look up interferon. It it messes with you mentally. It it causes weight loss. It actually causes depression. It causes insomnia and like a form of torture is not letting someone sleep. So imagine being on drugs that, that don't let you sleep. So so they were saying they weren't going to put me back on interferon. Well, the American doctor kept me on – he put me on a 36-week uh, regimen of interferon, ribavirin, and Incivec, uh, which was – Incivec was an experimental drug with a hell of a lot of side effects, but it was effective. And by the way, it was never approved due to the side effects. And this treatment actually cost me $80,000. It wasn't covered by the government. And the one mistake I made during my first treatment was I thought I was Superman. I continued doing my grappling training. I continued working my regular job. And it was only adding to the side effects, but at one point I ended up having a mini stroke. So the second treatment after six weeks, the side effects became too much. So I ended up uh, going on leave from my job, which caused terrible financial strain and put me in debt for a long time. But I don't think I would have made it through without it. But the Incivec, it caused horrible bug under the skin itching. And this is why it was never approved. And I'm talking about itching through your whole body, including your genitals and your rectum. It was it was freaking horrible. And, and I remember at one point, um, I really wanted to kill myself. The the itching was so bad, and the itching was the itching never went away. It went from mild itching to like severe horrible itching um and i remember at one point i i told uh, my ex-wife you've got to take me to the hospital and, and we got to tell them i'm going to kill myself if they don't give me something for this itching and they eventually did but it, w- it was that bad it's, it was like i cannot take this itching anymore i'm gonna have to kill myself because i'm itching 24 hours a day so they ended up giving me something strong on that particular night Luckily, the Incivec was only the first three months of the 36 weeks of the treatment. That was the worst part about it. Um, but yeah, they increased my dose of ribavirin, uh, extended my time on the treatment. And, um, and yeah, it, it, it was a horrible, horrible time. And during that time, um, they actually took away my my job from from the city of Ottawa, even though I was on leave, and it was related to the side effects from my medication. And then I ended up having to 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 go through an arbitration process to get my job back, which eventually I got twenty five grand and my job back for being wrongfully mm-hmm. dismissed while I was on uh, my my treatment. So. I, that was that was a hellish um, time in my life, but it cured me. I ended up getting cured uh, in December 2013, and that that put the Hep C portion of my life back. And I never really talked about this, but I actually, I actually did wrestle amateur in 2014, and I did end up getting third at nationals in Edmonton in 2014. And the only reason I did it was because I had gone through all that that treatment, and I just wanted to to show that even after all that, I could still compete at a fairly high level. Yeah. But but at that point, again, uh, I just realized that the pro wrestling was a better idea by that point because amateur wrestling costs so much money to compete in. You're paying for flights, and you're commuting to Montreal. Which is sixty to eighty bucks in gas, yeah, it's out of the pocket, every time. Yeah. But but the cool part about that is, uh, for 2014, I was back training at TriStar and with Doug Eats, 
um, who, whose son is doing really well and his daughter ended up um, going to the Olympics. Yeah, Dory Yeats. But Rory McDonald. And, yeah, Dory Yeats. But when I was training at TriStar, um, which Doug Yeats at that time had a program there, there was a lot of UFC guys that would often do amateur wrestling. So oftentimes I would get to like trade with the UFC guys who were actually like UFC fighters on TV at the time. So like I remember like there was nothing more satisfying than, than driving home from those practices after like holding your own against the UFC guy as an amateur wrestling. It's like your your body is drained. You you couldn't push yourself any harder. And it's like the I just remember those being the most satisfying workouts of my life. Just go just going in there, not getting your ass kicked by those guys, not beating them or anything, but being taken to the limit. Yeah. And just driving home being like, Man, I left it all in that practice room. Those were those were those were great days. How come? Well, did you ever fight an MMA match, or did you ever lean into that? Like, was there anything in terms of competition for you in that? Uh, at the time, I was signed by WWE in two thousand nine. At that same time, I was training in MMA, and I had a fight booked. Around the when they found out I had FC was my pre contract medical. So that prevented me from fighting in MMA. And actually, here's the here's the sad part about after my first treatment, I think I told you, I kept, at that time, I really wanted to do MMA. And I had, I won the Canadian Open in grappling and the Ontario's in grappling. And, and I was really taking it serious. So I kept training MMA the whole time I was on the first treatment. And you have to wait six months after treatment to find out if uh, if you're cured. I was so confident I was going to be cured. I remember I stopped that treatment at the beginning of February or something. My six-month post-treatment was in July, and I had a fight booked for August 2010 at the whole casino. There's posters of it out there. So that was the second MMA fight I had booked. So I just remember walking in, and this was honestly probably the lowest day of my life. I remember walking in because the, the doctor was confident because I had responded well while I was on treatment. I was testing negative. He thought I was going to be cured from the first treatment. And my plan was um, to fight MMA and show WWE that, hey, I got clear to fight MMA. I should get my wrestling contract back. So I, w I remember walking in there. I was in shape because I was training to fight in, in August. I was like in amazing shape. Uh, and I was so confident that I would, that I was going to be cured and my life was going to get turned around. And that's when I had the meeting with that doctor <laughs> where, where he told me that, um, that, that, that the hepatitis C was back. And then like, I just remember it was like, fuck. Yeah. Now my now my uh I have to cancel my MMA fight and, and this doctor's telling me it's gonna be eight years before a new treatment. It, it was just terrible. It was like I just remember I, I I I walked back to my car, which I was still poor at that time, so I hadn't parked at the actual hospital. I had like parked on a side street. I remember calling my dad and my dad, at that time, he had nothing to say. He was blown away, so it's not like he could even comfort me. He was just like, "Okay, that's terrible." Yeah, and I just remember sitting there, like crying, being like, "What the hell am I gonna do?" Because, as I said, I lost my group home job. It's like now I'm now I'm stuck doing bouncing jobs, um, and my part time job at the city because of the job that I'm doing with the city that I've been doing for like 15 years now it just never the way the union works it's a great job but it's only like part time you're not allowed to go full time um, but yeah I remember that being like the lowest point because it's like I became I was good at MMA at that time and, and like I couldn't compete in yeah. in MMA so that that's when I actually stopped training in it too it's a lot of pain, it sounds like, right? And a lot of 
like dead pathways, right? Like closed off opportunity, right? Which is incredibly painful, right? And how did you build yeah, out of that? And like, that's I, yeah. the only thing that got me out of it. The only thing that got me out of that was the amateur wrestling, because I remember talking to someone yeah. from Wrestling Canada. It was Clint Kinsbury, uh, who I don't think is in Wrestling Canada anymore. But I remember uh, talking to him, and he was the one, because he was in MMA at the time. I forget how I crossed paths with him. Maybe he came and trained at the school I was at or something. But I think it was somehow during that time I had mentioned to him the reason I didn't fight was because of the Hep C. And, and he had mentioned to me um, that, that they didn't discriminate against athletes based on Hep C status um, for amateur wrestling. And then so I think that was at the point in time where even though everything in my life was going to shit, at least doing the amateur wrestling, it gave me something to work to, which I was like, okay, well, I'm going to work to the Olympic trials and try and make the Olympics. So that, at least, even though I didn't get that goal and maybe tearing my meniscus a couple months before the Olympic trials had something to do with it, but um, it at least gave me a goal and got me out of my uh, slump because it gave me something that I could do despite having those issues. So, yeah. Thanks for sharing that, man. I mean, like it, I, I hope anybody listening to this, that is in a dark place saying, yeah, like set a goal, right? Like find something to work towards, right? Even whatever you can, right? Just having that ability to move yourself towards something, right? To bring you through it, right? Cause I'm a firm believer that meaning and purpose, right? Or having things that you're trying to do in life is, is a way to carry you out of dark times. Right. And, you know, from that point on, right? So that's like, definitely, yeah. yeah. But you tell me about your professional career right after that, right? So I, I, I was wondering, are you, you're you wrestling, um, Great North Wrestling, right? Is that what it's called? Or what's the, the, the organization that you've had a lot of your matches in? Great North oh, Wrestling. Right. But, but actually after that, I ended up having a pretty good pro career and I ended up building my YouTube channel, which now has, almost 350,000 subscribers, but I actually was, strangely enough, I had a WWE scouted match in 2014. Okay. So the year after I was cured. Yeah. And out of that match, I was supposed to be looked at again by WWE in 2016. Yeah. However, even though they had sent me my itinerary and I had an official tryout, somebody at the top level, they were talking to me for seven weeks. They were going to give me another shot. Yeah. Somebody kiboshed it a week before. They just sent me a, an email saying, we regret to tell you that you're uninvited to the tryout for, okay. for at the time it was called NXT and it was in Florida. Okay. So I remember at that time, I, I, uh, I thought to myself, okay, well, somebody at WWE is holding a grudge against me. I'm just going to focus on YouTube and my own stuff. Yeah. And, and by that time, I had about 30,000 subscribers. But then I realized, okay, at, at, at one point in time, I thought my if I wasn't going to be in WWE, it was going to be like the end of my life. That was what I always wanted. Yeah. But by this point in time, I'm like, okay, well, I'm enjoying YouTube and yeah. doing my own thing. And I was also getting acting jobs that were paying decent at that time. So I'm like, I'm just going to focus on that and not waste any more of my time trying to get in WWE. Mm -hmm. And I never did again. And I built my YouTube channel to the point where it became my uh, my job and main source of of income. And I and I found that if I had a good interview, I could get the same type of high from having a good wrestling match. Yes, I yes, I still wrestled all over. All over the states, became a Texas champion. Um, had a good, had wrestled a lot of my heroes. Again, yeah. one of the reasons I wanted in WWE was, was to wrestle my heroes, and I've still wrestled a lot of my heroes. I've wrestled like thirty yeah. Hall of Famers in my career, and not only wrestled them, but interviewed and and I still work to this day with my heroes. Like last weekend working with, with Kevin Sullivan, who used to be the head writer of WCW and wrestled against Hulk Hogan. Yeah. And he's a legendary guy in the business. So I'm still working with my heroes 
and, and living the dream that I wanted, just maybe not making the, the millions a year at it. But, uh, but I've, I've ended up finding other ways to be satisfied in, in my life. Devin, what's the link to your channel? How do, can you just rhyme it off the, the actual link so people can find your Hannibal channel? Like, what's the, how do they find it? It's called The Hannibal TV on YouTube and okay. they can search it up. And it's, uh, and it's not only wrestling interviews, it, it's, it's MMA interviews too. Okay. I've, I've I've met a lot of MMA legends. I be I became friends with with, with Dan Severn when I went to uh, uh, during lockdown. I I spent about five months in the U.S. A month of that was in Phoenix, and I was seeing Dan Severn regularly in Phoenix, and and I got to go to Don Fry's house, and both of those guys are very amateur wrestlers as well. But yeah, I, and Mark Coleman, I've um, yeah, he won. With. He won the UFC, right? Early days of it, I think. Right? Is that correct? Like he was yeah. a yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. But all of those guys did. Mark yeah. Kerr, another amateur. Mark Kerr, yeah. But Mark Coleman also won the UFC. Another amateur from Ohio State. Mark yeah. Kerr, I think, was ASU as well. Um, but yeah, I mean, I've I've got to hang out with with MMA fighters as well, and and also. Yeah. I do, I do UFO interviews as well. So I've met, yeah. I got to the, my interview with Paul Hellyer, who was yeah. the highest ranking government official to first speak out about UFOs. That, that interview is my favorite interview ever. And it's been bought by three different TV companies yeah. since I did it. Yeah. Because I saw, it was I saw that one. He ever did before he, oh, he's passed. I didn't know that. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, yeah passed away and that was the last one he did that was like an hour and a half long and it took me years to work on that but because it was the last one um three different television companies have bought that interview off me to license it to air on clips of it on their uh, on their respective tv shows so i mean i've i've got to meet a lot of a lot of interesting people over the years yeah there's a I want to tell a little story it's a, it's a little name drop but it's the year so I was working in a group home as well at the time and and there was a, an, an older gentleman that I was supporting in the home and and I I knew just a little bit like I don't know how old he was but he was maybe in his 60s but he liked professional wrestling right so you know go back to when he was maybe his teenage years right I, like a lot of the professional wrestlers back then so I, I said you know I said what I, I asked him one day I'm like who's your favorite professional wrestler and he was watching uh, TV, and he, he turned to me and looked me dead in the eyes, and he said, "Gene Kaniski." Have you heard of like a G, uh, he's an old old? Have you heard of him? Like, yeah. So I was like, "Oh, oh he was NW. He was world champion." Yeah, yeah, and I he's was from but, BC. Yeah, and I was like, "That's uh, that's pretty wild," because I think you know when I was out in BC, he's a bit of a he legend. A bit. Oh, sorry. Can you see me now? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, he's a le- he's a, yeah. he was an, a, a legend out there, right? And then, so I said, well, I, I asked the guy that I was surprised. I said, well, do you want to go see some wrestling? And it was the time you I think you fought Dan Severn in, in Hawkesbury. Is that correct? Is that or am I remember? So I brought him. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So I brought him. Uh, I brought him there. I grabbed him and a couple of the guys that wanted to go. Right, and we went and we sat. I, I was like, I'm not going to sit in the front row, right? But we sat a little bit back, and it was fantastic, right? And I remember. It just lit up his his life. Like he got to shake hands. I think he shook your hand. He shook hands with uh, Dan Sarah, remember? But it was it was neat to see him sort of be in that moment, right? And, but I'll always remember the way he looked at me, and he was just very straight. Said Gene Kaniski. Makes sense. He was probably a real tough dude back in the day, right? Like, yeah, I think he was also an amateur and another amateur from BC. I don't know if you're aware of this, but. Earth, you remember Earthquake John Tenta? He was yeah. also Canadian champion. He I think he was. A, I think he was a world champion too. Yeah. I think, but I, I'm not. I'd have to fact check that. But I think he. Yeah, yeah. yeah. He, he was really good, and then he yeah. went into sumo. He died. Yeah. He died. I don't know what happened to him, but he died in his 40s. But he was. He oh. was extremely uh, great in amateur. Yeah, he was. Yeah, the Earthquake. I remember him in WWE. Right, like his. Yeah. Um. Listen, man, you've had some good chats with people over the years but you brought up uh, paul hellier and uh i haven't seen uh, the one with i think it's avi Loeb, right you talked to him too right 
Oh I'm, yeah, I did do, do Avi Loeb, who's uh, who's a there you go, a Harvard professor. I like doing yeah. the ones where it's like I could interview these crazy wrestlers that the next week yeah. talk to a Harvard professor. Yeah, it's neat, right? But I, I saw the Paul Hellier one. I actually bought his book. As I think he talked about his book in your in your interview. But let's get into some meat and potatoes. Like, what about aliens, right? So you've talked to some people that are. They've got vantage points, right, or views, right? What do you think about the alien thing? Do you think, you know, do you think we're alone in the universe? Do you think there's other creatures out there, or do you have any of your own insights to it, or things, or what do you think? I I also interviewed, by the way, one of my most popular UFO interviews was Travis Walton, okay. who I interviewed in Snowflake, Arizona, and he was the subject of of the Fire in the Sky Hollywood movie about his alleged. Uh, abduction yeah um i you know i'm one of the more neutral uh people out there i've i i try and interview the more credible people i have interviewed some that 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 i think are, are a little far out there but i mean there there is one one the main reason i'm interested in that is because i mean the u.s has admitted it there's unidentified uh, flying objects in our skies and actually underwater. These things go underwater um, and in our atmosphere and outside of our atmosphere, and and we don't know what they are. So that's what I'm interested in because it's yeah. like, I mean, I am a, I do do some paranormal interviews and I have had a, a paranormal experience, so I'm somewhat interested. In, in ghosts, but the reason I'm interested in UFOs is like these things are in our environment, and, and we don't really know what they are, and there's nothing we can do about them, and they're just flying around with impunity. Um, so that that's my interest in them. That, that they're whether they a lot of people say that they could possibly be Russia or China, but these things have been seen in Russia. In China too, and they they display traits that of technologies that that are far beyond uh, anything that we are known to have. Who knows? They could be deep black ops uh, yeah. from the U.S. government. I don't I don't know exactly what they are. I'm I'm fairly neutral to them. All I know is that they exist. One th- one thing I find interesting is a couple months ago. Um, there was that Chinese spy balloon in the sky, yeah. But there was also three other objects shot down that they never found the wreckage of, and they just kind of vanished. Like yeah. the news reports kind of just just vanished about them. And it's like, well, there was three other objects that were important enough to shoot down with high powered missiles. And one of the missiles shooting down one of them actually missed the first one. So if, if if the other three unknown objects were just also balloons, which which they I don't think they ever fully said that they were balloons, and they never found the wreckage of how yeah. how did they miss with a high powered missile one of the shots? Yeah, that stuff doesn't miss. It, exactly, but <laughs> it's like they never found the wreckage of this, yeah. really. Yeah. And then, and then the news reports just kind of went on to the next thing. But it's like, yeah. what were these other three things that actually caught? One of them was shot down over Canada, like here. Over, over, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Where you're an area you're familiar with. Yeah. Um, yeah. My brother-in-law, I, I, my yeah, my brother-in-law lives like my dad lives on the lake, right? And my brother-in-law, and my sister's family live with them. And I, I sent him a message. I'm like, so are you going? You can basically walk the lake in two minutes from my dad's. I'm like, you going down to check out the wreckage? He's like, yep, bringing my dog. And he was going to go walk along. But to your point, right, where I don't know how deep the lake is. Are they saying it's so deep that it's not recoverable? Or is it recoverable and we just don't know? Or Yeah, or did they recover it and not tell us? Because obviously, if it's a matter of national security, they're not going to say, oh, we yeah. recovered this. Here's yeah. the pictures. They did show the recovery of the weather balloon. But they never actually said that the others were weather balloons. And I actually interviewed a special forces guy from the U.S. And I'm sorry that his name escapes me, but he lost a leg in battle. And this was right around the time of this. And he said he found it disturbing 
that he couldn't really comment on it, but he said he found it disturbing about these other three objects that they got into our airspace. Uh, so, I mean, it's a, it's a little weird that people just forgot about these other three objects. And I'm not saying they were necessarily alien, yeah, but they were important enough to, to send high powered missiles after. And both the president and the prime minister did press conferences about them. And then we just forget about them. Like that, that was a little weird to me. Uh, so yeah, you make so that's good... what interests me. Like, what are these things? Yeah, you you make a good point, right? Is this just advanced technology from a certain nation, or is it actual off-world tech, or like what's going on here, right? Like, I think that idea is the o- the only thing that 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 we know for sure is it's scary. I think maybe that's part of it too, right? They they don't necessarily. I'm sure governments are like, yeah, we don't need to disclose this to the general population, right? Because the general population, a lot of people don't want to know, first of all, right? Or that it would be very troubling, right? I mean, I think that's the quandary with if, you know, if it was confirmed that we have been visited, right? What does that do for the the psyche of of the people on Earth, right? Does everybody go into a frenzy? I mean, does it become sort of this apocalyptic or is there benevolence? Like, are these, would it be? stuff to help us who knows right yeah it's pretty wild uh... well actually uh, um what's his name jacques uh i think his name is jacques Grant, or jacques valet jacques yeah. yeah yes We're, and he's been interviewed a lot i was actually there's a there's a clip from another interview of jacques valet on my channel yeah which i asked permission to post where where for the people that that that, that say that these things are, we should not worry about them and, and they're only here to protect us, blah, 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 blah. Jacques Vallée said on the record that there, and, and this guy knows inside information, he's worked with governments, but he said there was at least two times where they actually activated nuclear missiles and mm-hmm. they could have actually caused nuclear war. If it wasn't for people acting real fast and stopping these nuclear missiles from going off. And, and by the way, these aliens or whatever it was that turned them on, we're not going to turn them off. They actually somehow, it, it happened, I think, in both Russia and the U.S. In two separate company, in two separate countries. Yeah. These, there was, there was, uh, UAPs or UFOs. Uh, seen around these nuclear silos, then they activated unactivated yeah. nuclear missiles. Yeah, and it was the countries themselves that had to go into panic mode to turn them sure. off. So the, for the people that said they're only here to stop it, um, they they definitely have an interest in in our nuclear stuff. Yeah, um, I'm not exactly sure what it is. Some well, people say uh, it could affect. If they're in our atmosphere and stuff, it could actually have an effect uh, on on their propulsion systems or whatever and cause them yeah. issues. But I mean, they, there has been negative. They have caused um, uh, radiations and burns to to civilians, and they have caused, according to to military reports and stuff, some some of our own vehicles. Um, to, to crash and they have caused human harm. That's why the U.S. government is now interested in them because mm-hmm. they're going into flight paths and stuff. And, and, and like, it's important to know for, for aviation purposes, what's flying around, uh, wh- when there's both military and commercial, uh, airlines be- being affected by this. But also the interesting thing you brought up the Avi Loeb interview where, where we talk about and, and these things are seen a lot by military pilots, right? And not yeah. not all of this is going to go public when it's being yeah. seen by military stuff. Some of it's been leaked. Um, but um, Avi had a good point. Are they actually watching our military stuff more, or is it just because these military sensors are so good that they're picking this up and this is really happening everywhere? Yeah. So one of the things that that Avi, I think he has something called the Galileo project going on. He's trying to put the same military type technology in neutral areas to see if it will pick up the same type of activity. 
Um, yeah. So it makes so sense, that, right? Like when you think about like, let's go back, I don't know, uh, 40 years ago, right? Like you wouldn't necessarily be able to record or see a lot of stuff really, right? Like, but your point, yeah, is the tech from our species getting so good that we're starting to notice, right? And notice certain things happening, right? I think the idea is what I've learned too is it's like once the first couple of nuclear detonations went off on Earth, that there's something cosmic about that, right? It's kind of like, you know, if you're a species out, out in the universe or whatever, and you, you see a nuclear detonation on a faraway blue planet tucked away, you know, it's like, oh, there's something going on there. It's kind of like, you know, if there was an island and there was, there was only chimpanzees on the island and suddenly they've invented dynamite and they're blowing it up, we would be kind of like, what's going on, right? So that, I think that's my understanding is that a lot of this stuff really became a lot more commonplace is when nuclear detonations were gone, going off, right? And certainly does that register on technology outside of the planet and hey there listeners just an afterthought here i want to say that that chimpanzee dynamite thing i heard from joe rogan that's not my original idea yeah, yeah and the foo fighters name like a lot of people think the foo fighters is just the name of a band but really during world war ii they were calling foo fighters these unidentified flying objects that were being seen during aviation battles because mm -hmm. apparently whatever these things were they were very interested in what was going on in, right. in world war ii that's where the whole name uh food fighters came from but also i guess we've detonated nuclear bombs in the ocean i guess for various testing reasons and, and there's a big connection with ufos and water there's something going on where they're seen a lot in the water and going into the water and submarines have picked them up going at huge speeds underwater. So it's like, is, are, is us detonating these things over oceans and stuff yeah. also piquing their interest? But one thing is for sure, these things have been around forever. Like there's been paintings of these on, on walls yeah. from Christ's time. Yeah. There's been yeah. documentation of these. And a lot of people think, that the whole chariots in the sky and gods actually can't come from some of these biblical experience were actually aliens. But for the people that say that, well, uh, they've been around forever, not necessarily something to be concerned about. Well, maybe now that we're getting smarter and, and setting off these bombs, as you said, and becoming a, a threat, maybe let's say they have installations on earth. It's very possible. Uh, maybe they're seeing us as a threat. And also, how do we know that new, new, uh, beings aren't visiting? Maybe how, how do we know when everyone on earth doesn't have the same intentions? Every country on earth yeah. does not even have the same in good intentions. How do we know that every single extraterrestrial, yeah. um, group of, of whatever beings or coming from all the, every different planet? is only yeah. going to have best intentions. Maybe some new one is going to discover us. So it, well, that, it's, yeah. intra it's not something to ignore. Yeah. Well, yeah, that's, um, I remember seeing the Paul Hellier interview, right? And reading his book. I can't remember the name of his book, but he posits that there's multiple, multiple galactic species, right? And to your point, right? I mean, are, are these guys benevolent and these creatures hostile and, and everything in between, right? I mean, is it more a, a mix of a bunch of stuff? There's, I think it's something called the Project Blue Book, which is, is a, I think it's a lexicon actually of intergalactic species, right? That I don't know who authored it, right? But it's like, yeah, is there, it would make sense that there'd be different kinds of creatures out there. But, <laughs> yeah. But how do we know who's... And by the way, for the abductor, for everyone, for everyone that says there's, they're benevolent, there has been abduction cases where they have found implants in in various people that and they have not been able to identify what these implanted stuff are yeah and, and governments have actually like like researched this and some of these abduction experiences i'm sure some of them are made up but others are quite traumatic like travis walton's if that happened yeah. that was extremely traumatic so we can't necessarily all say that, that they're benevolent yeah Devin, let's let's shift to the state of the world, okay? So, what what do you, what's your take on the future? What are you hopeful for? 
uh, and what keeps you up at night if we're to shift in a sort of a philosophical slant right is that a can we do that like what do you think like what do you think about the future and and the world and you know the good the bad and the ugly of it well i i i'll be honest i do i do do a lot of research on uh on consciousness and also ufo related stuff and yeah. i i try not to worry about stuff or, or think about stuff that i can't do anything about yeah so i don't think about these pop, possible nuclear wars that could happen and i don't think about politics because i there's zero i can do yeah uh, to be affected by this, so I just kind of worry about my own own projects and and things that I yeah. I can control and, and and for my personal future, um, I just hope to continue building my channel and and that's the one thing that we talk about. I mean, you can clearly see I, I'm I'm very interested in, in in the UFO topic. I'm very interested in consciousness. Yeah, uh, and this is stuff that like when I was in the wrestling bubble, I only thought my life was in WWE. I want to do more interviews and research related to this stuff as yeah. I get older, and and expand and maybe maybe do more celebrity interviews and interviews yeah. with with politicians like Paul Hellyer and, and yeah. expand it into different domains. But as far as what's going on in the world, there is good and bad stuff. But but as I said, I can only control my own uh, projects, and and sometimes that's hard enough to control because there's there's definitely uh, elements that enter your life that that can make life more difficult. Um, so yeah, what you can and can't control is important, right? So you're saying you just. Look, I've got these things lined up that I'm going to do and pursue and things beyond that. Yeah. What, what kind of influence do we really have when you think about it? Right. So there, there's I, nothing. And then to, to, to worry about that is a waste of energy and you only have so much yeah. energy. And when you waste your energy on things you can't control, then you're taking energy away from stuff that can benefit you in your own life. So I try not to, not to worry about things out of my control thinking about advice for younger people right so you've got you wear many hats right and you've got many things that you've done in your life right but let's think maybe we can categorize right so let's let's give the theoretical example or the hypothetical example whatever of it a nine a kid in grade nine ninth grade says i'm going to join the wrestling team right so he's, he gets his equipment he goes shows up for practice what what kind of advice does that kid need or what do you think would be helpful for that kid starting off in grade nine in wrestling? I think the most important thing in amateur wrestling, especially in high school is cardio. So I, yeah. my best advice for like a young amateur wrestler is get your cardio up because especially in Canada, I know it's a little different in the U S where they start younger. Um, now, now amateur wrestling, I think is more popular than ever, by the way. Um, with the crowds they're getting in the U.S. for for big meets, and they've done stadium matches, and I think UFC has really um, added to the popularity of amateur wrestling. But I think, especially at the younger levels, cardio is important. Yeah. I know that helped me. You guys know that I was not the most technical, yeah. but I think doing the high school practice, then driving to the 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 club practice, then driving to the gym after every night, that made a difference in in my cardio. Uh, yeah. So I was able to just tire some of these more technical guys out, particularly at, at heavyweight. So I would say, I would say cardio, and yeah. I would say listen to elders, listen to advice of, of older people, which is hard to want to do when you're younger. Yeah. But honestly, they 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 know they know what's best. Yeah. I think your idea of cardio. But yeah, it's a different it, world. You're, you're talking about something you can control too, right? You can control your fitness. I mean, obviously there's probably genetics at play, but, you know, pushing yourself to be more fit, right? So that that can transit on the map that you can outlast, particularly because, you know, technically everybody's got different levels of competency, right? And that can be refined too, right? But being able to grind, right? And push yourself beyond, right? I mean, I think in wrestling, there's always those matches where you feel there's a breaking point with the other person. 
because you push them so hard. And then there's points probably where you they push harder than you, right? And you you break, you lose your mental focus, or you're exhausted. And then there's those matches where it's there's no it's relentless for two people for the whole time of the match, right? Nobody breaks, and maybe there's a one point difference or something, right? So those are I think those are the best ones, right? But sometimes too knowing that yeah, you're, like you said, right? You can hit three practices a day, you can do your cardio and, and, and get your physical fitness up right to push yourself right because it's i mean wrestling is a very physical sport right so yeah and the idea of yeah who can you seek out right like talk the, to the people, one right? advantage i had i think i think because i wanted to be a pro rest i i started lifting weights like the moment i turned 13 and could join a gym because i knew i have to have a good body so yeah. i think that also helped me obviously in amateur wrestling that because not all kids start lifting weights as soon as they're they're 13 and i remember back in those days a lot of people still thought it stunted your growth i remember yeah. people telling my parents you shouldn't let your son lift the weights so young he's, it's gonna stunt his growth well obviously yeah. i became almost six four so yeah it didn't have that effect there's a lot of misinformation that we've gone through it sounds like yeah yeah now let's think about someone that wants to be a professional wrestler so what, what kind of advice would you give? Let's say that let's take the same kid in grade nine, maybe or a different kid in grade nine that says, I want to be a pro wrestler. What would you tell that person? I, um, uh, it's a lot easier to be a pro wrestler nowadays than, uh, when, when I started, it was more of a protective industry and there was less. When, when I started, uh, WCW had just closed, ECW just closed and there was only one place to work, WWE. And there was yeah. all these very seasoned guys, so it was extremely hard to get in. Now yeah. it's a lot easier to get in because there's about five companies um, and there's very few seasoned wrestlers. They're hiring people now more than ever with no experience. They're hiring yeah. a lot of college wrestlers and, and athletes from, from other sports. But I wouldn't recommend the industry for, for, for anyone. It's a terrible, terrible business. Honestly, I, w I really wouldn't recommend it yeah. for, for, for any, yeah, it's, it's bad business. I had the love for it and the obsession for it. And luckily I've made money, um, over, over the years through interviews and stuff, but it, it's not a good, it's not good for your body and yeah. the morals taught in, in, in pro wrestling are, are terrible morals. And I've only realized since getting divorced about a year and a half ago that and like researching and researching like how to improve as a person some of the morals that the wrestling business taught me over the years um that i'm that i'm only changing now yeah. after seeing how negative they were so i really wouldn't recommend it it's a bad it's a bad business to go into you're treated like crap. There's no, uh, there's no health insurance. Your careers are going to be short. Um, like it's not a good business to go into. Yeah. You can see on the other side, right? You had to rewire yourself. It sounds like, right? Or you are rewiring yourself as you come out of it. What, what about? Yeah. Um, I mean, when I went got into it, um, uh, I mean, you were considered more cool as a wrestler. The more you could cheat on your girlfriend, his wife or wife. If you, the more drunk or screwed up you could be the night before a match and still go and perform a good match, that will make you more popular in wrestling. I mean, those, those are the kind of values that, that are taught in the wrestling business. And I mean, there are, there are some good parts about wrestling. Yeah. It, it's a fun job. The, the high you can get from performing is good, but yeah. overall, the, the promoters treat you like, like absolute garbage. So. It's better to go into other things and, and definitely get your educations and, and use your mind. You're, you're going to end up in wrestling with concussion issues, which I also have. I have legitimate brain injuries uh, from all the hits to the head I've taken over the years, not just from wrestling, but from I was a bouncer for many, many years as well. What about, you know, you've built a successful channel, right? You're talking to some interesting people. You're expanding your interests in that sense, you're probably learning a, a, a shitload of cool things by the people you meet and get to talk to. Right? So what would you tell 
a young kid that says, you know, I want to start my own channel, right? Or I want to be a podcaster or whatever. I mean, it's quite popular right now, right? Podcasting. But like, what would you tell that kid? It's because now that like I have noticed since these interviews became popular back before these online interviews, there wasn't that many people doing it in wrestling. So I was, I was actually the first to put free wrestler interviews online before that people were having to buy dvds and stuff and everyone was saying oh i'm just a super fan putting interviews out for free like i was getting like ridiculed for that and now everybody does it but the, the, yeah. the thing is for people that say it's easy i mean and, and, and i i i have a youtube uh manager that that i talk to and, and for instance the one, the one, the one thing I have, the one quality I have, I honestly am not the smartest person in the world, and and I accept that. And it's not just from from being uneducated; it's from concussions and stuff. But the one good trait I have, and it's helped me in amateur wrestling and in life, is I'm a very hard worker. And people think that that YouTube is easy; it's not. And my YouTube manager, when I got the, the latest one, she said, I can tell you built your channel on hard work. And, and I noticed some people have said some of my negative people, because I actually have more views than some companies worth multi millions of dollars. Like I have incomparably more views than Billy Corgan's wrestling company from the Smashing Pumpkins and, and other people that are rich or have more fame than me. But the reason that I do well is because I post a lot and I work a lot. And yeah. some people will say, well, you post a lot more than these people. Well, I'm still beating them. So, so the, the way I'm doing it is from working harder and posting more. And that's how I get overall more views. I might not, I might have a bunch of hit videos, but I go for quantity over like, I know that I'm not going to be able to just post one video a day and have the success that I have. I probably average five to seven videos a day and I, there hasn't been one Christmas where I haven't posted a video. For instance, I work hard. If I'm on vacation somewhere, I'll try and post a video. If I like there, there's only been a few times where, 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 where there were days haven't gone by where I haven't posted because I know if I don't work, I don't make money. And for people to say, get a real job. There's some critics out there, get a real job. I mean, no, this is a real job. You got to continuously work at it. Uh, some people will get lucky and, and they'll just, uh, catch on, um, for whatever reason. Maybe it's a hot girl that will, that will easily get tons of followers or something. But, but for me, it's been about hard work. So, so I would tell people that be prepared to work really hard and and research how to get better i i try and research what what the trending topics are i constantly follow the wrestling news because uh i also expanded after a while to do wrestling news as well um and that's helped my channel grow uh so uh, it's it's constant work there's not like there's not three hours to go by that i don't see if if anything big has happened in wrestling because because, for instance, if a wrestler dies and I'm one of the first to post it, which has happened a few times, that could mean that's paying my rent for the week. Yeah. So you always got to like be on your guard. Well, I think uh, you're you're sharing with me hard work, right? Hard work in many ways can carry, right? And can facilitate success working hard. And you also, I think, are making the point of like, slowing down or, or stepping back there can be this sort of black hole of atrophy right it's like you could slide backwards right if you're not constantly working towards movement and going forward with things right like that, in that sense so but it sounds like it's you know yeah, your, your work good. ethic going up growing up right it's paying off so and a good example of that covid happened i was going crazy here because i get like i couldn't get footage so like i went to the u.s i found a way even though you're technically weren't allowed to go to the U.S., I found a way to go to the U.S. And during the COVID period, I was getting like 9 million views a month because I found a wrestling company that was still running in the U.S. 
that I attached myself to and and I was able to still get footage. So you gotta be like you gotta adapt, you gotta be a chameleon in in, in some ways. So oh yeah. And my yeah. my dad was a very hard worker, so I I got that uh yeah. that aspect from him. I mean I think it it can carry you in anything you do in life, right? If you work at it right and try like you said, try to improve, try to learn, try to get better, but also work, work, work at something, right? I mean, I look at life as like an input output machine, right? It's like the other, the other thing that I will tell people, uh, sorry, we got a hiccup here. Okay. You're back. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Your your computer froze. Sorry. We're back. Yeah. So the other thing you were going to say, there's another thing you tell people. Oh, it is like, do your, do your taxes and make, make, do good accounting of all your expenses related to YouTube because now you got to claim YouTube. And yeah. like at the end of the year, those are big hits of money yeah. you got to pay back. So yeah. make sure you have very good accounting on, on all your related expenses because you're going to get hit with that in the end otherwise. Yeah, it's, um, it's interesting you bring that up because I just did my 2022 taxes and I've, I've got a website and I'm selling books, a few here and there, right? But I got a lot of overhead, right? I had to get sound engineers and I had to pay for art to be created. So all that stuff. I, I implemented right because you're right. I'm trying to get ahead of this curve because it seems like the way the world is moving, right? The government is probably going to recognize that these are legit ways of people earning their their livelihood, right? So then keeping that lined up, right? Because yeah, it can be a headache, like you said, right down the road, right? So so listen, yeah, man. I, mean, I yeah. have another guy uh, named. Oh, I'm, I I was just saying that goes for pro wrestling events too because like I'm. Another guy has been taking over my wrestling company, Jack yeah. Kilby, great in wrestling, because I'm still helping him behind the scenes, but I don't, yeah. as I think you've got across in this, I'm phasing the wrestling part of my career out. Yeah. But I'm just explaining to him too, the importance of, of taking all those costs and, and documenting them. Because yeah. when I was younger, I did, I did not keep prop, proper documentation of my wrestling event promotion. Yeah. And at one point in time, I had to pay $40,000 in back taxes yeah. just because I never had wrestlers sign for their pay. Mm. So even though I had paid wrestlers all those years, yeah. they never signed for it. So I had no proof oh, that wow. I was paying wrestlers. So it, it seemed like I was putting all these events on um, yeah. without having to pay wrestlers. So it came back to bite me. So, yeah, yeah. the importance of documentation and, and knowing the accountant side of it is a yeah. big thing for any yeah. business. Um, let's wrap up with you. So you talked about, you, you know, your, your wellness, right? We talked about psychological wellness. We talked about physical wellness. Um, you know, we talked about you, you know, rewiring yourself literally. Right. So like what role does nutrition and exercise and um, self-development play for you at this stage of your life? Like how, how does all that fit for you? Well, I have to admit, I, I made I made the biggest, uh, mistake of my life uh, about a, about a year and a half ago i i actually like uh cheated on my wife uh with uh, my wrestling manager at the time and and i i thought that was like a smart thing to do yeah. but it ultimately led me down down a path where where i realized well that i was not I, I definitely had a, I have a good side to me, but like it definitely made me realize a lot of things. I, I, I had an error. I had a success on YouTube and I had, I, w- I was popular and, and making more money than I'd ever made in my life. And, and I didn't realize that it wasn't all me. So yeah, I had other people uh, helping me. So yeah, that, that came back to, to humble me and now i have uh realized uh like like how important like being a good person is but i learned the hard way yeah so yeah i i have realized that uh self-help is very important and i've actually been researching like how to become a better person yeah. And not make those mistakes again, yeah. because I've I've suffered 
you 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 can be humbled or get humbled, and I learned that the hard way over the past few years. So, um, yeah, I would definitely recommend that to people. Learn, learn, listen to these self help videos, and and don't let success go to your head. And have good mentors. Don't don't look at people um, that have been divorced four or five times in their life. And, and have made millions of dollars and lost millions of dollars as mentors. Use successful people that that are that are good in their head and 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 have had like twenty thirty year marriages as as mentors and people to look up to. So that's what I am doing now, and uh, trying to become like a better person in my life. And, and actually be helpful to the world and have a good impact on the world. So, so yeah, I've, I've made mistakes in my life and I'm trying to learn from them. And I think I have become a better person over the past while, but it, it's an ongoing process and, and I'm definitely working on it. And yeah. Yeah. So that's where I'm heading. As the as the years go on, I'm not looking to be the next Ric Flair anymore. I'm looking at Elon Musk as, as somebody to to look up to, uh, like like these people that that are extremely successful and and intelligent. Yeah. So yeah. yeah, steering yourself in that direction. Yeah. Can we do this again sometime? For sure, and I'll yeah. and I'll show my mascot before we leave yeah. here. Yeah. Piper. Hey, hey Piper. Who, it was tough too. She actually, uh, she almost died back in November. I had to give her her CPR. She choked on a piece of cheese, but but she survived. And recently, a dog stepped on her leg. Her cousin, the yeah. golden retriever, and and she's still fighting and, and walking around. So she's a great mascot uh, to the channel. And and yeah, yeah definitely. Yeah. Again, Sure, for sure. Yeah, we'll do a part two, man. Listen, you you made yourself vulnerable today, and I appreciate that, man. Like that's, you know, this is only going to be audio, right? They they couldn't, they won't see us, right? But they'll probably hear in your voice you know, everything you've shared and, and the emotions that have come up for us today. So, I want to thank you for taking the time to to chat, and uh, yeah, let's do a part two down the road, right? Maybe there'll be interesting content that you want to share. But uh, yeah, it was good to see you, man, and and thanks again for sharing. No problem. Glad, uh, glad to see you're doing well. And as I said, I'll always appreciate, uh, your training from high school. Yeah, it was, it was something that I look back fondly upon too, man. It was a good time. So I'm glad that we had that connection, right? So, okay, man. Well, listen, we'll, uh, we'll keep in touch and, uh, we'll do part two down the road. Sounds good. And subscribe to the Hannibal TV on Facebook and YouTube. Anyone listening, have a great day. Got it. Take care, Dad. We'll talk soon.